And I started looking into it, and a bit like uh, the film The Matrix, where you, you take the red pill instead of the blue pill, and you suddenly realize, at least in this area of medicine, it's all just started to fall to pieces. The problem is people have tried to understand heart disease by trying to find a thing that causes it, cholesterol, LDL, whatever, rather than saying, actually, what we have is a process going on here, you know, and what impacts on the process, and many things can. The relationship between saturated fat consumption and heart disease was the exact opposite of what we were told. I mean, the exact opposite. I mean, if you draw a graph, the correlation is perfect. It's an inverse correlation. This obsession with the diet and the cholesterol is just not right. It's completely wrong and it needs to be got rid of. Malcolm, at one point you were a doctor who believed in the cholesterol hypothesis, which is currently the dominant one. At one point along your journey, you started to see some cracks in that and things unraveled to where you are today. Let's take it back to the beginning when you started to see there might be an issue here and how things have pivoted since. A number of people ask me, because obviously I've written and lectured and bored people about heart disease for many years now. They said, why, why did you get interested in it? Uh, well, I think we go back to when I was at medical school in, uh, in Scotland. Um, at that time, Scotland had the highest rate of heart disease in the world, maybe vying, I think, with Northern Ireland. There was possibly other countries that are up there, but we were at the very pinnacle of heart disease deaths. Uh, so obviously you're interested in it because I once wrote an article saying it was decimating the population. Decimating means kills one in 10 of the population, not that it kills everybody. And over a 10 year period, 10% of adult males in Scotland were dying of heart disease. So it was pretty extraordinary death rate. Uh, so, you know, the, you know, you're at medical school, you're getting bombarded with information left, right, and center. Uh, and, and we were told it was due to the terrible Scottish diet. We used to, you know, uh, apparently we used to eat Mar deep fried Mars bars and all sorts of rubbish. And, uh, uh, and that raised our cholesterol levels and then, then that caused us to have heart disease. And, you know, you wrote it down and put it in your book and that's what causes heart disease and sort of move on uh, because, you know, you don't have time to get interested in everything. But, um, I'd actually visited France a number of times, still do. We've got a chalet in France, in fact, at the moment. Uh, one thing I was, was very clear about France was they certainly didn't eat a low-fat diet. They certainly didn't eat a low-cholesterol diet or, or a low, um, basically anything diet uh, that was supposed to be bad for you. And yet their rate of heart disease was about one-sixth that of Scotland. So I just thought, well, you know, that doesn't add up. So I started looking into it. And I started looking into it, and a bit like uh, the film The Matrix, where you, you take the red pill instead of the blue pill, and you suddenly realize, at least in this area of medicine, it's all just started to fall to pieces. Things that you thought were solid facts sort of disintegrated in front of you. I, I started analyzing different countries in Europe and looking at their heart disease rates and their saturated fat intake visits. I mean, I didn't even know what saturated fat was when I started off. I, and you know, polyunsaturated fat, what's that? Cholesterol, I sort of assumed cholesterol and fat were sort of the same thing. I discovered that they're not even remotely the same thing. I had never heard of a lipoprotein. I hadn't heard of any of these things at all. Uh, and, and no one else was terribly interested. It was known what caused heart disease, cardiovascular disease, shall we say which is really thickening and narrowing of arteries. So the story was, you eat too much fat, the level of cholesterol in your blood goes up. It never bothered me that I never asked the question was, well, how does eating fat make your cholesterol level go up? Are they the same thing? Or are they different things? I think most people sort of think they're the same thing, but anyway. Uh, and, then, uh, and then the cholesterol is deposited in your artery walls, they thicken and narrow. And when they get very narrow, you get a a blood clot forms on the narrow point, completely blocks an artery in your heart, and that's a heart attack or a myocardial infarction. Same thing happens in the arteries in your neck. So I mean, it it, it would sort of, and, and I looked at this. The, the still is, I think, that it's probably not a book anymore. The number one cardiology textbook was called Brownwald, uh, an American cardiologist, and it was about this thick, and about three thousand pages, and no one could read it. If you lifted it up, carried it, you had to give yourself a hernia. 
Well, I was sort of looking through it to whereas, you know, what's the core? It was all sorts of manifestations of heart disease and what you do and blah, 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 blah. And when I tried to say, well, where is it in this book that it says, how does it happen? There was literally a paragraph about that long saying, if you eat too much saturated fat, your cholesterol level rises and that causes coronary heart disease. And that was it. There was nothing else. Uh, and you sort of begin to wonder, well, okay, that's fine. But once you look at the saturated fat intake across Europe um, or and the world, what you find is there's really no correlation at all. I mean, France has the highest saturated fat consumption in Europe. And it also happens to have the lowest rate of cardiovascular disease in Europe. And the second lowest, uh, um, the second highest consumers of saturated fat are, are live in Switzerland. And they have the second lowest rate of heart disease in Europe. And then when you look across the other countries, the ones that stick in your mind are from Eastern Europe. Ukraine at one point, I think it was Ukraine, had the lowest consumption of saturated fat. And they had the highest rate of cardiovascular disease. And in fact, when, when you looked at the countries, the, the, the relationship between saturated fat consumption and heart disease was the exact opposite of what we were told. I mean, the exact opposite. I mean, if you draw a graph, the correlation is perfect. If there is no, it's an inverse correlation. In fact, um, in the midst of this, I'll just raise up a book. I read it. I now know this chap, but it's called, it's the first one I read called Eat Your Heart Out by James Lafani, who actually writes for a major newspaper. He's a, a doctor. I consider him a friend now. He says, the controversial bestseller that exposes the healthy eating con and basically, this was a was a fairly small book, but it's about 150 pages, just saying the diet heart hypothesis is bunk. And everything that he listed was the stuff that I'd already been looking at. I thought, well, at least there's two of us <laughs> in the world. And then you start looking back into it, and you realize there were people, in fact, George Mann, uh, most, I mean, no one's heard of him now. He, um, he set up the Framingham experiment in the 1940s. And the Framingham experiment was a town in, near Boston called Framingham. And they got everybody in this town, I think it was about 6,000 people. And they used them as a kind of model, you know, a bit like the Truman Show. So they had the blood pressures checked, they had their weights, their cholesterols, and everything to do with heart disease. How much did they smoke? What did they eat? And they put it all down and then mo and measured them and monitored them. This study is, as far as I know, is still going on. So it's been going on since 1948. And that was the study during which it was stated that saturated fat consumption raised cholesterol and caused heart disease. But George Mann had been looking at Maasai villagers in Kenya. And he'd gone out to study them. And he found that they had the highest cholesterol and saturated fat consumption of any population in the world. Male Maasai villagers ate meat and drank milk. And that was basically that. If you're a proper Maasai warrior, you didn't do pathetic things like eating vegetables because that made you weak. Uh, and, and so he, he studied them and found that they actually had very low cholesterol levels. Uh, and they had no discernible heart disease at all. No, nobody in that population that he studied died of heart disease while he was studying them. Uh, and he, in fact, ran a conference in the early 1980s, I think it was. Uh, I've got the, the book somewhere, and uh, it was um, probably, probably pluck, pluck it out of my, my library for you, where, where they had a small conference saying, you know, the diet heart hypothesis nonsense. And actually there, he said, cholesterol doesn't cause heart disease, along with several other professors. Uh, a small book, never really got anywhere. And when you started looking into the history of it, it was clear that it was just plucked. This idea was just plucked from the sky. And then the story was built around it. And one man more than anyone, Ansel Keys, who people have possibly heard of, he did a study of various countries around the world and looked at their saturated fat consumption versus heart disease and came out with his famous well, this six or seven country study showing a clear and powerful correlation between saturated fat consumption and the rate of heart disease. But he went and studied 21 countries and didn't bother mentioning what happened to the other 14. 
including countries like France, for example, where he had the data, but he just didn't like that data very much. So he got rid of it and just said, oh, it's not really important. So we looked at Japan, which had a very low saturated fat consumption with a very low rate of heart disease. It still does. And then countries like the US and Finland and Scandinavia, it's very high saturated fat consumption and very high rates of heart disease. And that was enormously impactful. And everyone just sort of went, aha, we, we have the answer. We know what causes heart disease. The American Heart Association picked up on it very early on and ran with it. They are the biggest proponents and always have been. But then essentially it just became the accepted wisdom. And without anything else on the horizon, it just took off. Uh, and, and I was very much, you know, if I said to anyone, well, it just doesn't make any sense to me. I, I can't understand what's going on. They just look at you as though you're just just an idiot who doesn't understand anything. And then you'd say, well, well, explain to me how if you eat saturated fat, that ends up raising, of course, you don't actually have any cholesterol in your bloodstream, which is one of the first things I found out. I said, well, why are we calling it cholesterol? There's no cholesterol in your blood. No, not floating freely. It's all carried around in small like what they call lipoproteins, lipid protein spheres, which are, are about the size of virus particles or, or something of that sort. They're, they they float around in the blood. They contain fat and they contain cholesterol quite often joined together. And and they're almost they're little transportation devices because fat and cholesterol are insoluble in water. So if you put them into your bloodstream, they would just clump up against the artery walls and get stuck there. So that definitely would cause heart disease if they ever reach that point. So these lipoproteins um, are actually what we're measuring when we say it's cholesterol. And there's lots of them. They come in various sizes. They're synthesized. They have a particular purpose, which is to carry fat and cholesterol around the body uh, and, 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 and dump it where it's needed. Um, and yet when Ansel Keys was doing his original work, he didn't even know there were different types of lipoproteins. He just thought it was cholesterol. And then we've ended up with this stupid terminology, cholesterol levels. Don't have any cholesterol in your blood. And then they started off. So so the original studies all looked at cholesterol, and more recently they've done this kind of, well, there's low-density lipoprotein, there's high-density lipoprotein, there's very low-density lipoprotein, there's intermediate-density lipoprotein, there's chylomicrons, there's blah, blah, blah. I'm not surprised people are confused by it because it flips around and flips back and forward. Cholesterol lipoproteins, good cholesterol, bad cholesterol. It's just nonsense. We might stop and let's use one form of terminology. But even when you do, the bad form of cholesterol, which isn't cholesterol, it's usually called low-density lipoprotein cholesterol, LDL. A lot of people have heard of that. And then you have high-density lipoproteins, which are supposed to be good, although they contain more cholesterol proportionately than an LDL molecule. So again, it's like you almost have to have a three-day lecture on all this stuff before you can even start discussing it because it's like you can just see people going, hold on, hold on, what are you talking about? Why are you talking about this? Why are you talking about that? Why are you talking about this now? You know, uh, So it, it does become complicated even to have a debate on it because, you know, and, and the books I've written, I spent quite a lot of time explaining what are we talking about, you know. So we have, we have for instance, you have, coronary artery disease, you have coronary heart disease, you have atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, you have ischemic heart disease, you have, it, that's only the tip of the iceberg, there must be 25 descriptors for the same thing. And then people go, well, what's IHD? Well, that's ischemic heart disease. Was that the same thing as cardiovascular disease? Well, it sort of is, but it's not quite, it, you know, it's, so, the actual disease, you have to focus down on that. What is the disease that we're talking about? And the disease that we're talking about, and I have no argument with anybody in the mainstream stream about the disease we're talking about, is, is narrowed arteries, narrowed arteries that are full of something, that maybe fat or maybe cholesterol could be also, and in fact, it is actually all sorts of things, all right? And, um, uh, and that narrowing is often what they call plaques, so there's little areas of thickening. It's not the whole artery doesn't narrow down and narrow down like that. That doesn't happen. 
what happens is one bit of the artery gets what they call a plaque stuck to the side of it or within it or again the terminology and and these these thickenings can protrude into the artery wall sort of and the this is the thing that we're talking about really so it's possible to have no plaques anywhere in your arteries except one in your heart and that one plaque can do the called rupture causes a blood clot and you die of a heart attack unlucky if you look at other people they've got hundreds of plaques all over the place they've got five in one artery in their heart and six in another artery in the heart and lumps and bumps all over the place so it's but basically the disease we're talking about is atherosclerosis which is a term for thickening and lumpiness in the arteries in your body that can happen anywhere they can affect your kidneys it could be your brain it could be your heart it could be any any part of you it can be in your guts you can have you can have an infarction in your guts that kills part of your bowel and then causes ischemia and necrosis in your bowel. And so it's, it's an artery disease. It's not heart disease. If you're enjoying the episode, take a second and let me know by clicking like and subscribe below. Thank you so much. And now back to the episode. You just said there, it only affects the arteries. So our whole cardiovascular system is connected. But an interesting piece of this is that the veins are unaffected by, you know, atherosclerosis? Yes. Well, this is uh, this is something I I ask other doctors just to slightly amuse myself. Why don't we get thickenings in the veins? The the LDL level is the same. So, if it's a case of LDL, like proteins, small particles getting into the artery wall in some way why don't they get into the vein walls the concentrations the same and they go oh uh well yeah it's and they don't they don't know they've never even thought about that i mean yes also there's blood vessels in your lungs it's called the pulmonary circulation and the blood pressure in your lungs is a lot lower than it is in the rest of your body it's the right side of your heart so the blood comes into the right side of your heart from the veins it's pumped out the right side of the heart into the lungs pulmonary vessels comes out of the lungs goes into the left side of the heart where it then comes out of the left side of the heart and travels around the rest of the body that's where the high pressure bit of the system is the veins are low pressure the pulmonary vessels are low pressure and yes there's no um there's no atherosclerosis developers in the lungs normally either naturally unless there are situations where that can happen but in most people it just doesn't happen. So 90, 60%, 75% of the blood vessels in your body do not develop atherosclerosis, despite being bathed by precisely the same level of LDL. And where this gets even more interesting, if you take a vein and use it for bypass on the heart, then it can accumulate plaque. Oh, yeah, it does, but it doesn't only count it. It does very quickly. So, yes, if you strip a vein out of the leg, which is generally where they come from, and use it to stitch it in above the blockage bit in your coronary artery and and below it so that you have circulation going between the two, on average, within seven years, these are pretty highly, almost entirely clogged up with atherosclerosis. So we know that veins can develop atherosclerosis, but only if you ask them to act like they are an artery. We're going to get into the nuances of the new theory and and what you think is happening there. But I think a good place to go beforehand is to stick with this cholesterol hypothesis and start to break it down, starting with the beginning of that, where saturated fat in the diet leads to increased cholesterol which isn't even possible. So take us to the physiology and talk about what happens when we consume saturated fat and how it can't possibly be converted to cholesterol. Or again, terminology here, we're talking about the lipoproteins that contain the cholesterol. Exactly. Well, precisely. I mean, um, yeah, well, it's interesting. You know, if I read, if you read physiology and biochemistry books, which I, I do, it's almost impossible to find this information out. It's almost as if there's a there's a sensor goes around saying anyone trying to find out about cholesterol and diet 
we'll never be able to discover it here because it was not written down anywhere. So, but basically, if you eat fat, any fat, saturated fat, polyunsaturated fat, monounsaturated fat, any type of fat, right? So vegetable fat, it doesn't matter actually. But if we stick to the saturated fat hypothesis, if you eat saturated fat, it goes into your bowel, obviously, where, where the body starts digesting it. The first and essential step of digestion is that all fats must be linked to bile, which comes from your gallbladder. And the gallbladder, the bile is actually cholesterol crystals. That's what it is. And the, these cholesterol, it's not cholesterol crystals, it's cholesterol, it, it, it's could just think of it as cholesterol. So it's uh, ejected from your bile duct into your bowel, where it then sticks to the cholesterol, so it sticks to the fat, saturated fat molecules, which is the only way they can then be absorbed. If you don't have bile, so people who've had a gallbladder operation and don't produce much bile, if they eat fat, it just goes straight through, which is not very pleasant. <clears throat> so if you've had a, a gallbladder removal, operation you have to be very careful how much fat you eat otherwise your bowels go all wonky anyway so the bile acids a aka cholesterol stick to the fat the fat is absorbed in your bowel through the through the, through the bowel wall if you like and it's then constructed packed in to a very large lipoprotein called the chylomicron which if an ldl was the size of a tennis ball a might chylomicron be the size of a beach ball approximately now, interestingly, that travels up from your bowel in a in a, uh, a specialized duct called the thoracic duct, and it's then released directly into your blood vessels, all right, or a blood vessel, the upper vena cava, if you want to know. Um, and it travels around the kind of microns travel around your body, and the fat is removed from them as they pass fat cells or muscle cells that need more fat, or any type of cell that says, "I would like some fat." And the fat is stripped out of the chylomicron, so it shrinks down and down and down and down and down until it is about the size of a low-density lipoprotein, at which point the liver picks it up, absorbs it, and takes in some of the cholesterol and some of the saturated fat that's within it. And then that will be sent back out from the liver, along with newly synthesized fats and cholesterols, to be then to travel around the body and then lose fat and cholesterol. So the thing that the liver makes is called a VLDL, a very low net cell hyperprotein, which would be, say that was a tennis ball, it may be the size of a football. Anyway, they exit the liver, they, they shed fat mainly, and then they shrink down to become an LDL, at which point 99% of them are absorbed back into the liver to be reused for this shuttling system of fats and cholesterols and a certain amount of it's taken out so cells that want cholesterol stick out an ldl receptor into the bloodstream that locks on to the ldl and the whole thing is taken into the cell whereupon it's all broken down and the cholesterol is used for some of the very many important things that cholesterol is needed for in the body so when you going back to the chylomicrons fat doesn't go through the liver it, it bypasses the liver it doesn't go into vldls and because it doesn't go into vldls it can't go into ldls because ldls are made from vldls and vldls are made in the liver where the fat doesn't go so if you're saying if you're eating saturated fat that raises your ldl level you say well where's the pathway there is no pathway there is no path there's no physiological pathway for this to happen so it makes no sense so you say well what else can you eat well you can eat fat and you can eat protein we'll ignore protein for the mile because that's really complicated the other substance most people eat are carbohydrates rice potatoes burger buns you know stuff coca-cola sweetened drinks blah, blah blah that is absorbed into the bowel and it all then goes to the liver because the circulation in the bowel travels first through the liver liver sucks it all up does what it will with it and then it releases what it what it wants to into the rest of the bloodstream so if you eat vast amounts of sugar although the sugar level will rise 
the liver is controlling most of it and it doesn't let it out. It tries to keep it down as much as it can. And, and of course, that works pretty well until the point where your liver is full of sugar. The rest of your body's got as much glucose, which is which sugar and glucose are not the same thing. But glucose is the primary sugar type that we utilize in the body. So you eat carbohydrates, the body breaks it down into simple sugars, mainly glucose. That goes into your liver where it starts to be stored if there's any storage space left. If there's no storage space left in your liver, and you can store about 900 calories as glycogen glucose in your liver. Once you've reached that 900 calories or eight or nine or a thousand, however big you are, your liver has to do something else with the sugar that's now coming in. So it converts it into fat through a process called de novo lipogenesis. And the fat that the liver makes is saturated fat. 95% of the type of saturated fat it makes is called palmitic acid, which just means it's got a chain of 16 carbon atoms. As the carbon atoms go up, the names change, and they, all these ridiculous names like oleonic acid. And, and, no, anyway, I can't, I can't, there's millions of them. I mean, it sounds terribly scientific. It just means this is what we've decided to call a, you know, a, a saturated fat with a carbon chain of 16. This is what we call one that's 20. This is what we call one 14. Is, they're, they're even numbers. You don't get old ones. Um, yeah, no, I don't think you do get anything. The, the simplest saturated fat, by the way, is acetic acid, which is vinegar. Um, because <clears throat> it's only got one carbon atom, but it otherwise is a, is a carbohydrate. So, um, anyway, stepping back, if you eat fat, the fat doesn't go into your liver, it travels around your body, it's it's utilized and doesn't get into your liver. It, it's your liver that makes very low density lipoproteins from fats and cholesterol, and it wraps them all up and it sends them out into the bloodstream. Very low density lipoproteins as they lose fat, shrink down. The first thing they shrink into is called an intermediate density lipoprotein, which you've never heard of and no one talks about. And then they, when they shrink down any further, they become a low density lipoprotein. So there's only one source for low density lipoproteins, that's VLDLs. And what makes VLDLs go up is eating high carbohydrate meal. And this is not contentious, by the way. I'm not sort of just making this up if you want to go. And anyone who wishes to, to go and, uh, and read this up will find that this is, is just, the, just the case, all right? This is physiology stuff. It's, there's no controversy here at all. Okay, let me jump in at this point to highlight what we've said. So the first half of the hypothesis we're saying can't be true because saturated fat can't become LDL. The second part, let's, you've started to get into this, we can have LDL, of course, and that comes from VLDL made in the liver. As the body takes from that VLDL, it becomes IDL and then LDL. Now, the second part of the theory we have to get into is, is this LDL, which we know isn't from saturated fat, but we still need to debunk this part of the theory from carbohydrates to VLDL to IDL to LDL, sorry for all the terminology here, can that LDL still be a problem when it comes to atherosclerosis? So let's take that part of it now and talk about yeah. any possible relationship there. Well, I think, uh, again, going back to, Interestingly, someone just done a study, which I've just blogged about, showing that um, people who go onto keto diets, some of them do have, all of a sudden, got high LDL levels, which apparently contradicts everything I've just said. But I'm not going to go into the incredibly complicated reason why that happens. But some people who eat no carbohydrates fire up a very high LDL level. And that's in part due to the fact that the liver has no need for the LDL that's floating around in the bloodstream because it doesn't need to make VLDLs because it doesn't have any fat to get rid of. All right. <clears throat> so it, it, it just doesn't bother absorbing it. Um, however, the study just looked and what they call a scan of looking at the calcium and plaques in people's coronary arteries, so people who've got these very high LDL levels, just A group, uh, versus people who just had normal LDL levels. Uh, over a five-year period, they found there's absolutely no difference in the plaque 
calcium score in the arteries. That's not actually published yet. It's coming out, but I just thought it was interesting. However, go back to why did people believe this in the first place? Well, obviously, people were talking about cholesterol. There is no cholesterol. So they decided to focus on LDL as being the, the, the molecule that is dangerous. And, and part of the reason for that is when you look into plaques, you will find a high ish, higher concentration of bits of broken down and mangled and some still um, apparently intact particles of LDL. Right? Or not, that's true. And so people reasoned, reasoned that, that where, where can they have come from? The only place they could have come from was the bloodstream. So therefore, the higher the level, the higher the concentration, the more likely it is that it travels down this concentration gradient into the artery wall where it causes it to thicken and the whole artery to become narrow. So that actually is not a bad hypothesis. All right. If if you believe, A, that what you're seeing is LDL uh, rather than something else, and also you believe that LDL can pass through... You know, all blood vessels are lined with what you call endothelial cells, which are single cells, a bit like a wall tile or something. They're obviously a bit more complicated, vastly more complicated than that. Your veins have got them, your arteries have got them, every blood vessel's got these endothelial cells, and they stick together, and they form a very smooth and um, impenetrable barrier to the passage of substances that they don't want to pass, all right? So I sometimes, I don't, I know that in Britain we have a lot of what they call terraced houses. I'm not sure how many terraced houses they have in America, but it's basically houses where there's a house and then there's another house next to it, another house next to it. But actually, you know, um, they are, there's no gap between them, right? There's a, there's a wall, obviously. Uh, and I, I use the analogy sometimes of if you wanted to get from the main street to, to somebody's got back garden in a row of terraced houses. There's only one way to do this. You have to go through the door, and then you go out the back door, and then you've got through the house. All right? And if you think the cells are like this, the, the idea, well, it's not an idea. Cells, endothelial cells, are linked together incredibly tightly. There is a, there's, there's all sorts of proteins that lock them together. So that nothing may pass between them, right? So they're like a row of terraced houses. There's no gap. There's no way of getting through. Uh, and yet people seem to say, "Oh well, LDL can just get through." It's, well, if LDL could get through, why don't really small molecules get through as well? Why is it just LDL? Which is you know, literally LDLs this size, and proteins um, uh, that that float around in the blood are, are kind of this size. So something this size can pass through, and something this size cannot. And when you look at cells, they, they actually control the entry of single atoms into them, like sodium atoms and potassium atoms. They're called ions because they've got a charge. There are, there are gates to allow atoms to pass into cells, and they're called sodium gates and calcium gates. And there's lots of them. So the body, if the body allowed sodium atoms to enter cells willy-nilly or potassium ions to enter cells as they wished, the cell would be dead instantaneously. That's really is cell death, is once you fail to control what gets into you. When you die, the potassium level in your bloodstream goes shooting up. That's because the cells die and they can no longer they pump potassium into them. All right. So they have a higher potassium level inside than outside. If that um if the cell dies, the, 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 the iron channel switches off and the potassium floods out. Right? Now, this is really just to give you some idea of how tightly cells control what happens within them. And also, endothelial cells, what, what passes between them? Because if you just allowed anything to pass between two endothelial cells without control, what happens to the other cells behind is they would just be obliterated. You can't allow this to happen. The body is incredibly complex. I was there is a journal called Tight Junctions, I think, which is a journal entirely uh, dedicated to looking at the junctions between cells and how they work. All right, 
And I sometimes use the example of Ebola, and people say Ebola is a terribly deadly disease. Do you know why it's a deadly disease? What is it in an Ebola virus that kills you? Nobody knows, apart from about 10 people, and I happen to be one of them, Um, because I looked into this. And what happens with Ebola is the Ebola virus, for whatever reason it does this, opens up these tight junctions between endothelial cells. It causes them to open and disrupts them. I've no idea why. I don't think anyone really knows, but it's the thing that it does. It's maybe its way of gaining entry into the body. It probably is, actually. So it opens up these tight junctions in the cells. And when it does that, the blood starts to escape from blood vessels into the body. That's called hemorrhagic fever. So your eye, your eyeballs go red because you're bleeding into your eyeballs. Your tongue falls off because it's disintegrating. Your bowels fall apart. You bleed to death with hemorrhagic fever. Because what's happening is the tight junctions in your blood vessels are being opened up. And when that happens, you die. That's just to give you some idea of how important it is for the body to control the movement of any substance from any one part of it to any other part of it. It's all enormously tightly controlled. If you go to the brain, there's something called the brain blood brain barrier, which you may or may not have heard of. Which means that certain substances and many drugs, if you take many drugs, they can't get into the brain. Some can, some can't, but the blood brain barrier is a barrier to the entry of things, mainly viruses and bacteria, because the brain is very susceptible to their entry and it kills it. So in the brain you have a very tight structure, even at the very smallest blood vessel level, that allows no entry, and it doesn't allow, the brain does not allow LDL to enter it. It The brain has to make, and therefore the brain has to manufacture its own cholesterol. So you have cells in the brain called glial cells. They make cholesterol. They synthesize it in the brain. They then send it out using a specific lipoprotein called APOE, and it goes to the neurons where it is used to make the myelin sheath, which you've probably never heard of. Myelin sheath is very high in cholesterol. It is the thing that surrounds all neurons and allows them to work. And without cholesterol production in the brain, you have no myelin sheath. The myelin sheath break down and you die. Simple as that. So LDL can't get into the brain because of the blood-brain barrier. The blood-brain barrier is lined by very tightly attached cells, even at the smallest blood vessel size level, which in a way is proof, if any proof is needed. LDL cannot get past endothelial cells unless the endothelial cell wants it to pass, which happens in the liver, because obviously if you've got LDL in your bo- floating around in your blood, your liver is having to use receptors and pull it out all the time. Right? Now, I, I use sort of these examples to say to people, you're talking about something unbelievably fantastically complicated here, which nobody understands all of this and how it works. What we do understand about it is the body just doesn't allow substances to start. Just because the concentration gradient is higher, right? doesn't mean the substance will pass at a higher rate. That's not how the body works, all right? It's not what happens. So for people to say, basically, when you start looking into it, oh, well, what happens if you get a high concentration of LDL is it passes through the endothelial cells into the artery wall behind and then starts building up into these plaques, right? So at that point, you have to say, well, why doesn't that happen in veins? Then concentration is exactly the same. The endothelial cells are exactly the same. Why is it not happening in veins? If it's a concentration gradient, if the concentration is higher, what's, why not? And they go, well, it just doesn't. So like, that's the explanation. No, that doesn't work. It can't work. That's not an explanation. And this is the type of thing. Once you start looking into it, you say, right, well, that doesn't work. So what is your explanation? Why don't you get atherosclerotic plaques and veins? Obviously, there's a difference in the pressure. Well, clearly. Well, clearly there's an indifference in the pressure. <laughs> it's the only difference between an artery and a vein. Not entirely true, but virtually true. 
And then, of course, there's another thing which no one's ever heard of, is that blood vessels, large enough blood vessels, and they don't have to be very large, I think, are supplied by their own blood vessels. And these blood vessels are called vasovasorum, which are the blood vessels of the blood vessels, if you can believe it. And interestingly, when you get to very, very, very small blood vessels like vasovasorum, which are actually called, which are actually capillaries at that level, endothelial cells are not a tight barrier because they couldn't be, because otherwise the blood would just circulate around and, and nothing would ever happen. At a very, very small level, endothelial cells have got what they call fenestrations, fenestra windows in them, when they're not quite windows, and the basement membrane that holds them together is a bit loose. Now, obviously, that has to be the case because if your blood goes through your kidney, waste products have to come out of the blood and then get into the kidney and then they're excreted. So there has to be at a level where the exchange can occur, and that's at that capillary level. So you've got capillaries inside your arteries, and LDL can move between capillaries and the underlying tissue of the body. So actually, if LDL wanted to get out of your bloodstream, it would be doing it at your vasorum level. There's nothing to stop it doing it there. But it can't do it the other way around. It can't come out of the blood vessel that way, but it can come in behind. So if it can do that in veins, arteries, why can't it do it in veins? Why can't it do it in the pulmonary blood vessel? So if your explanation is leakage of LDL at high concentration into blood vessels, it doesn't make sense in any way you look at it. There is no explanation for how that makes sense. The other thing to say is because we're talking about plaques. If LDL at a high concentration was just leaking through endothelium, then it, it would be leaking through the whole circumference of the artery at all points. It wouldn't just be leaking through here. It would be leaking through everywhere. So what you should be getting is a unified thickening of the arteries throughout the entire diameter of it. And you don't. That's exactly what you don't see. What you do see is sort of specific points, discrete areas where there is that a an area of a plaque. So if you're going to try and explain heart disease, you have to say, is why doesn't it affect veins? Why doesn't it affect pulmonary arteries? How can LDL get through um, endothelium when it there is no process by which it can do so in these blood vessels. Uh, why doesn't it go through the vasovasorum if that's just a leakage down a concentration gradient? Why isn't it, uh, you know, a uniform thickening full of LDL throughout the whole diameter of the artery? And these are just the most obvious problems with your hypothesis. And uh, I could go on, but we'll stop there. And then you say, right, well, again, it's. Well, you know, people say if you eat saturated fat, your cholesterol level goes up. First of all, you don't have a cholesterol level. Secondly, saturated fat has no connection between it, there is no connection between saturated fat and LDL. So, what are you talking about? Uh, and it's all the same when you start picking it apart. It's like the small child going, "Why, why, why?" And no one can answer these questions. No one even bothers to answer these questions. If you, if you go to, and I've spoken to cardiologists, many of them and try to get them to explain it to me. They, they don't even bother. They just say, well, it's proven. You know, it's proven. That's not an answer. <laughs> it has to happen in some way. What is that way? At which point you just get a deathly silence. You, know, you try it yourself, you know, dear listener, go and ask your doctor, how does LDL get through the endothelial cell? First of all, they won't have any idea what you're talking about. Uh, secondly, they won't even know what tight junctions are. They, they don't know none of these things, and yet they go, it just does. All right, That's the answer. It's like a five-year-old child where the parent gets fed up and goes, you know what, it just does. Okay, go away. Stop bothering me. All right, so we know the LDL isn't haphazardly passing through the endothelium and causing a plaque, but the obvious next question is, what if it's just, there's damage to certain areas of an artery, and then the LDL becomes a problem. Well, well, now you're getting to it. It's, clear, it's like, it's a step. It, it seems like if you start thinking about it, you think, well, okay, so what's going on? You know, well. Well, what I'm well, saying here is we can't let LDL off the hook just yet because. No, no, no. Well, it, you, there could be damage to an artery and then accumulation. We know it's not just passing through haphazardly. Yes, yes. But what if we're we're causing damage in specific areas, and then LDL becomes the problem at that point? Yeah. Well, um, 
that's more plausible. Other thing you've got to say is, well, what is it about LDL? Why isn't it other things in the bloodstream that are causing a problem? Why don't the chylomicrons cause a problem? Why does VLDL cause a problem? You know, what is it well, about LDL? Want, because everybody's pointing the finger at LDL. So we want oh, yeah. to address yeah. that part of the equation here okay, to yeah, well, yeah, of break course, the theory. Well, people try to do this. They keep, you know, because it's almost like we only have one uh, playground uh, in, in in this area and, it, and, it, and it's boundaried out and it, inside it's got LDL. And that's the only thing that you can discuss, you know. So the focus is, is so narrow. And um, well, LDL must be doing something else. I mean, people say, oh, you can get oxidized LDL, which is, I was speaking to chemists, this is just a ridiculous concept. Anyway, oxidized LDL just means it's got a bit more oxygen attached to it, having been kicking around in the bloodstream for a while. Everything becomes oxidized. If you leave meat out in the kitchen, it gets oxidized and goes off. If you leave your car in the rain and the salt, it gets oxidized and rusts. Oxidation is... Oxygen is a horribly reactive substance that reacts to absolutely everything, and, and it keeps us alive. And when people say to me, oxidation is terribly damaging, I, I always reply, hold your breath for five minutes and then tell me how damaging you think oxidation is. Um, it's a concept that has an oxidized thing can, could, maybe somehow damage the artery wall. Maybe. I'm not quite sure how it's supposed to, but it's supposed to. But of course, the body itself has oxidized LDL receptors. It's called LOX receptors. And they're specifically designed to take on board oxidized LDL and take them into endothelial cells. So uh, endothelial cells quite like oxidized LDL. They don't think it's a toxic thing. They, they sort of use it as an energy and, and repair source. So yeah, people are just, they grasp with straws, you know, go, well, well, you say to you, you've got an endothelial cell, it's lining an artery, and along comes an LDL molecule. And then what? Oh, it damages it. How? Well, it just does. How? Yeah. Moving another step forward, is endothelial cells are themselves protected by a layer, which is called the glycocalyx, which again, Ask 100 doctors how many have heard of the glycocalyx. The answer will be none. The glycocalyx is present on fish. So if you try and pick up a fish, it's very slippery. Unless you scrape the glycocalyx off. And then it's that sharks don't have a glycocalyx. That's why they're rough. But it's like little fronds. It's like a little forest. And it sticks out of your endothelial cells. And it, it, it stops damage occurring to these cells. Because it's it's very slippery, it's it's a buffer a buffered layer, and and it prevents damage. Right. It also contains and what they call anticoagulant substances, things that stop the blood clotting. It, it's where nitric oxide is synthesized within the glycocalyx, and um, the nitric oxide is the most potent anticoagulant substance known to nature. Right. So it's primarily designed just to protect endothelial cells, to stop anything sticking to endothelial cells, and also to stop any, any blood clots forming on top of endothelial cells, because otherwise your blood vessels would all clot up very quickly and you'd be dead. And that is what happens when you get sepsis, which you may have heard of. In sepsis, bacteria multiply in your bloodstream. They release toxins called exotoxins. The exotoxins damage the glycocalyx in the endothelial cells in smaller blood vessels first, and you get blood clotting occurring throughout your your body. And this is called um, disseminated intravascular coagulation, DIC. And because you've got all these blood blood vessels getting blocked up, your organs start to fail, and then you die. And that's why you die in sepsis. It's because of clotting in blood vessels. And that's caused by damage to endothelial cells and the glycocalyx. And you can actually measure the thickness of the glycocalyx during sepsis. And if it begins to get very, very thin, that means you are going to die, basically. And if it remains thick, that means you are going to live. Which just tells you how important the glycocalyx is as a substance to protect you from blood clots forming. All right.
Does, does LDL have any effects on the glycogelics? No. Does it damage the glycogelics? No. Does it damage endothelial cells? No. It's never been demonstrated to do any of these things. So why are you pointing the finger at LDL? It doesn't damage anything. It just floats about. You might as well point at red blood cells and say they damage the endothelium because they're quite big and they're squeezing through quite narrow gaps. You know? Well, no one's blaming, well, I blame red blood cells, but no one else is blaming red blood cells. So it's just, it, where's your mechanism of action? You know, where is it? Oxid. I don't care if it's oxidized. I don't care. I don't care if it's small and the latest thing, small and dense. Why, why would a small, dense more LDL molecule cause more damage than a, what they now call a light and fluffy LDL molecule? By the way, the difference in size is such that if you looked at them, you wouldn't actually be able to tell the difference by the naked eye. And yet we have these continuous, oh, it's not to the LDL, it's the protein attached to the LDL, which is called ApoB, which is all apolipoprotein B. Well, why would that damage the endothelial cell? What, what, what does it do? I mean, no one has any, any answers to these things. So it's you have a causal agent for heart disease that has no, never been an identified method or mechanism of action by which it does anything. And yet, People still keep pointing at it. Why? Because this is where this hypothesis started, and they are just never getting, they are never letting go of it. Right? They just can't. And it's, um, well, you see this with many things. Do people just have an idea and they get stuck on it, and, and that's that. So, so the focus is on LDL. And when it's not LDL, it's, it's light, it's small, dense LDL, or it's LDL particles, or it's oxidized LDL, or it's, but God's sake, it's got to be something to do with LDL. No, it's got nothing to do with it. It doesn't cause anything. It's a benign substance. It floats around in the blood carrying cholesterol and fat. And that's that. That's what it does. So let's I mean, talk I've, I've about seen... the anatomy of plaque at this point. Oh, yeah. Well, the anatomy of plaque. You've touched on this, but what different components can we find in there? Well, if you look at plaques, you you know, the, the idea seems to be there are a big lump of cholesterol or LDL stuck in the artery wall. That's the impression that is given, isn't it? And there's nothing else there. It's like um, there is some LDL there. I'll give you that. There's cholesterol there. I'll give you that. But there's there's there's, there's fibrin. There's red blood cells. There's white blood cells. There's, there's just everything really. And if you look at you know, I remember reading a paper where it said it's full of pultaceous material, and it's a word I'd never even ever heard of, despite doing medicine for years. I had to look it up. It doesn't mean anything. It just means it's a bit bubbly and wobbly. Sort of a bit like a trifle or something, um, but actually, if you look at what's in in the plaque of a that's been around for a long time, like in an elderly person, it's obviously been there for fifty years. You can't actually find any LDL. You can maybe find a bit of cholesterol, but actually, that's a very minuscule part of what it's actually made up of. So it's it is wrong to say that it's made of LDL or cholesterol, but and nothing else. Those things are there, but of course. Everything is there. Everything you'll find in the blood is there if you look for it. It it's, contains what is the contents of the blood, essentially. And there's another layer to this too, and you've alluded to this before, the fact that these remnants of LDL or pieces of LDL aren't necessarily coming from LDL like we're oh, talking yeah, about here. Yeah, well, this is another one. It's like, yeah, I did use the analogy of 12 angry men at one time, but not enough people had heard of it. But it's about where something so a young Latino boy is found guilty of a crime, um, basically because he's a young Latino boy, and then they build the evidence around it to put him in jail. And the twelve angry men are the jury put in the room to say, well, actually, when you look at the evidence, none of it. Although it seems concrete, it doesn't add up. It falls, falls to pieces. So yes, LDL and and um, here's another thing. Go and ask a hundred doctors. Have you ever heard of LPA? And they go, oh, I think I might have heard of it. And they say, what is it? They don't know. Right? It's just so people are absolutely certain they know what causes heart disease, and they haven't heard of the glycocalyx, they haven't heard of LPA, they haven't heard of vasovisorum, they haven't heard of anything really. Um, it's amazing. Um, um, it's called the Dunning Kruger effect. The less you know about something, the more certain you are you know the answer, um, which is which is really true here. You would think cardiologists would know this stuff, and they had never heard of any of it. I don't know what they learn as a cardiologist, but it sure as hell ain't anything to do. With this anyway 
LDL has got an evil twin brother it's called LPA, and it's called it's, it's written LP small a, and it stands for apolipoprotein A, or lipoprotein A. Sorry. And the reason it's called lipoprotein A is because it's got an additional protein attached to it called apolipoprotein A. Sorry, the technology is a swine here. The attachment of that added pro protein to an LDL molecule means it is now an LPA molecule. It is identical to LDL in all ways other than having this extra protein stuck onto the side of it. That's what makes it LPA. So it's LDL with an added protein, uh, it, which is a fascinating molecule because, you know, no one... I think there are some people who say we know why what it's for, but mainstream medicine claims they don't know what it's for. It's as if we have this really quite a lot of it around. Some people have more LPA than they have LDL. In general, it's about 20% the level of the LDL. So there's about a fifth as much LD, LPA as there is LDL. And it's about like people you know, saying, oh, half the genome is made up of junk. It's like, no, you just don't know what it does. So don't, don't come up with stupid ideas. So LPA... This extra added protein is key to what LPA is and does. Because if a blood vessel is damaged, so the endothelium has been stripped off or damaged or, bit, or more than one endothelial cells or section of L endothelial cells have gone for whatever reason, a whole series of things happens almost immediately and the blood, the, the body tries to block this area of damage. One of the first molecules that's attracted is LPA. And the reason it's attracted is because this molecule, apolipoprotein A, sticks to the damaged area, the underlying artery wall. It binds to it using a number of bind sequences, and it forms the an almost impenetrable barrier. So it's kind of like sticking a finger in a dike or something. Not quite, because obviously it's a flat thing that sticks to it. Sticking plaster. We call it sticking plaster. Your artery is damaged, LPA comes and acts as a sticking plaster. It's not the only thing that arrives on the scene, but it arrives there very early. And once it arrives, it's very, very difficult to get rid of. The reason why is because it's stuck to the artery sort of wall, so it's underneath the rest of any blood clot that might form. The other reason it's difficult to get rid of is that when blood clots form, obviously at some point they have to be broken down. Because if you've got a blood clot that's almost blocking an artery, or, or you know, if you've been stabbed and you've got a damaged artery and then it, there's a clot going here, the artery will, you, it can't stay blocked forever. Otherwise, you'd never get any blood flow through it. So the body works out ways of, of drilling holes in, in, in blockages to arteries and then allowing the blood flow to restart through the blocked artery. Right? There has to be that mechanism, otherwise you would be dead now, all of us. Right? because we are getting clots in, in arteries and veins, and they have to be broken down. They are broken down, and then one of the first steps that breaks them down is that the body creates an enzyme called plasmin, and plasmin, step back a bit further, the primary things that make a blood clot stick together and stop it being broken down are red blood cells that all bind together along with everything else and fibrin which is a sticky strand of protein that wraps around the clot and 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 makes it go really tight and holds it on and stops it being broken down so when you have a scab on your skin that's fibrin's making that hard difficult to break down thing that's why it's a scab really and um, obviously inside your blood vessels the same process is occurring on your skin, it breaks off and falls to the ground, a blood clot. But if it's happening inside a blood vessel, especially an artery, it can't just break off and travel down the artery because it will just get stuck somewhere and cause a heart attack further down or go into your brain and cause a stroke further up. So you can't get rid of it by just breaking it off. So you have to shave it down in size, essentially, you have to shave it away. And what you do is this enzyme called plasmin is specifically designed to break fibrin apart. So it slices bits of fiber in the part, and then the clot is gradually removed. All right, and um, and and that is an essential process. Uh, and in fact, you, you've heard of clot busters, which are cold, which they don't use so much now. They used to use them a lot. So if someone has a heart attack, you give them a clot buster, which is an enzyme 
that activates is you don't have plasma in, in your blood clot. You have this thing called plasminogen. And plasminogen is a precursor to plasmin. So you have to activate plasminogen to turn it into plasmin. So plasminogen activator turns plasminogen into plasmin. It's that slicing the blood clot apart. So the, the artificial enzyme you give is called TPA, tissue plasminogen activator, which is present all over you in various parts of your body. And if you give that as an injection, it goes to the area of the clot and it breaks the clot down and it opens up and then theoretically the heart attack causes less damage and you can survive it. Or if you've got a stroke, it breaks down the clot in your brain. So all these things get complicated, don't they? So you've got plasmin that slices apart fibrin and once you start slicing apart fibrin, the clot starts to be removed and so it starts to be got rid of, all right? Now, apolipoprotein A, which is a protein attached to LPA, is identical to plasminogen. It's the same length, it's got the same uh, amino acids in it, except it's got a different folding structure at one end of it. It's called a kringle, it doesn't really matter. This kringle means that TPA cannot activate it, and it can't activate the surrounding plasminogen as well. So it's an inhibitor of plasminogen, being turned into plasmin by tissue plasminogen activator. So if you've got a clot with a lot of TLPA in it, it's very difficult for the body to break that down fully. And of course, there's a good reason for that, because you don't want to break it down fully, because otherwise all you do is expose the area of damage and the whole thing would just keep going backwards and forwards at high speed. So LPA, if you have a lot of LPA in your bloodstream, it will be the first thing that sticks to the damaged area. It will be stuck against the artery wall. As the rest of the blood clot is shaved away, you'll have this high concentration LPA part of the clot absorb. Well, it, it will become absorbed into the artery wall. And what people have done is they've looked at LPA and they've said, oh, look at that LDL. And you go, no. No, it's not LDL you're looking at, it's, it's LPA. You're looking at the wrong thing. You think it's LDL, it's not, all right? So some researchers, this is going back a while, they took bits of artery that had been using coronary artery bypass grafts and stained it for apolipoprotein A so that it would show up if this was apolipoprotein A or lipoprotein B, ApoB, which is the one that's attached to LDL and also to LPA. So LPA's got... ApoB and it's got apolipoprotein A attached to it. LDL only has apolipoprotein B attached to it. So if you find both A and B, you're looking at LPA, not LDL. It can't be LDL because it doesn't have that protein. And when people looked at it and stained it for this protein, that's what they found. It was both proteins at the same place, B and A. Ergo, what you're looking at is not LDL, it's LPA. It's like a case of complete mistaken identity. This is just a fact. So we know there was LPA there when they did the staining, but was there any LDL? Could there they definitively LDL, say there yeah. was no LDL? I didn't say there was no LDL. There was some LDL. There was. I said, the other thing is that, that what happens is when you're making uh, fibrinogen into fibrin, it has to be made on a surface. It's brought together and constructed on the surface. And one of the surfaces it's constructed on is is the lipid surfaces of VLDL and LDL. For whatever reason, if you're going to take little thin short strands of fibrin and connect them together, this happens on a lipid surface. There will be some chemical reason why this is the case. I've never really looked that deep into this issue. So they become the... the the surface upon which fibrin, fibrin is created, and they will therefore be incorporated in some amount into the clot as it forms. That just has to happen along with the LDL. LDL will be into it as well. I mean, obviously, red blood cells get dragged into all blood clots as well, even though they have nothing to do with directly to do with blood clot formation, although they too represent the surfaces because red blood cells are basically just a huge rate like a protein. They, they, their cell membranes are high in fat and really high in cholesterol and free-floating cholesterol as well. So 
you know, everything in the body is connected to everything else. Blood clotting involves, you know, almost everything in the blood comes charging in and has some sort of a role when blood clots start to form, roles you wouldn't even expect. I mean, red blood cells, you get a red blood cell in, within a blood clot. And there's a link to the strands of the fibrin. The red blood cell changes its structure and shape to c compress itself down. And it, as it does so, it tightens the strands of the fibrin to make the blood clot much more tightly bound. It's, you know, it's, you're joking, you think, how did that ever come about? It's so complicated, all right? So, yes, there is LDL in clots, but actually, there's more. LPA, and it has a function, and there's a reason why you would find it. And there, you know, it's it, what's in a what's 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 not say what, what's in a plaque. What's in a plaque is everything you'll find in a blood clot, right? It's it's the same thing, such that the first person to ever propose that plaques were just blood clots in various stages of breakdown and change you know a thing doesn't stay the same the body so, so, so if you look at um you know a scar on your hand or arm 40 years after it happened there's very little left maybe except the little thin line you know with a bit of calcium in it a lot of the other stuff is just over time being gone so if you look at very old plaques and very new plaques they look different but the first person to look at, at plaques in any detail was an austrian researcher called Karl von rakitansky and he claimed that blood, that plaques, you know, people who say there was no such thing as heart disease before 1900, I would say, well, Rokitansky was studying plaques and arteries in 1850. You know, so come on, don't give me that. Anyway, he was looking at them and he said, they are basic, these are basically blood clots. I don't think he called them blood clots. He had a different name for them. Uh, and he created a thing called the incrustation theory, which is that plaques in blood vessels are blood clots in various stages of repair and change of their morphology. Right? Because she said, this, these are just blood clots. They're the same thing. Right? Uh, so it's, there's not exactly a new idea that, that blood clots might be plaques and plaques might be blood clots. This has been around for 170 years. And it's been proposed over decades and years and centuries by other people. Now, I'm not the first person to have picked this one up again. There's a guy called... Um, Dugid just after the Second World War, he said, yeah, well, I'm just looking at blood clots here. There's a guy called Ronald Ross who had a response to injury hypothesis which gained a lot of traction in the 70s, saying that basically the first thing that happens is you get damage to the artery wall, then a blood clot forms, and then basically after that, the process evolves as you would expect it to, and that's what we're seeing. And in fact, when I was at Aberdeen University doing medicine, I had a tutor called S. Elspeth Smith who was uh, doing research into heart disease. She wrote a lot of papers on this and, um, and said basically uh, all aspects of um, plaques can be explained by the process of blood clotting. And um, we cannot see this in any other way. I had no idea she had these ideas when she was talking to me when I was a little... A little uh, hungover idiot doing medicine in my first few years. But um, in fact, when I saw papers by E. Smith, I presumed it was Edward Smith because I didn't actually make the connection for a while. I thought, oh, that was her. She, she was trying to tell me. The first thing she said in one lecture, the five students, you know, small group lecture, she said, she said, LDL cannot penetrate the endothelium. Right? And I had no idea what she was talking about. So it's like, whoosh. Um, and I later came to realize she just told me everything I needed to know about heart disease in, you know, 10 words or less or whatever it was. And I just wasn't paying attention. And I wish I'd, I'd never even got the chance to speak to her. By the time I realized she'd worked it out, she was dead. You know, that was 10 or 15 years later. You know, she was there and wrote papers. You know, what do you think? But no one listened. You know, this is the fate. No one will listen to me either. It's just the thing. But, uh, uh, you know, this isn't my, it's not my idea. I just thought it's the only explanation that makes any God 
damned sense because it explains everything that we see. It just does. It's like, it's almost like a moment of re revelation, isn't it? You think, of course, how could anyone have thought this could not be the case? How could it be? But it is because LDL and lowering LDL is a multi-billion, probably a multi-trillion dollar industry now. You know, lowering LDL is the holy grail of the pharmaceutical industry. Maybe I'm just lowering blood sugar levels and blood pressure and stuff. But it's one of the three horsemen of the apocalypse. You know, there's four horsemen of the apocalypse. And the LDL causes heart disease, and if we lower it, all will be well. And by the way, here's another drug that I've just invented, and it costs $50,000 a year and stuff. And another, the experts... Well, they can recognize a gravy train when they see one. They're not going to rock that particular boat. If you're a cardiologist or if you're perceived as a world-leading expert in cardiology and you stood up and said, you know what, LDL doesn't cause heart disease, this is rubbish, your fall from grace would be instantaneous. You would become the, the, the ex-opinion leader in cardiovascular medicine. Your chance to speak at large conferences would be gone. Your chance to run big medical trials would disappear in front of your eyes. Your income streams would trickle and die. You would be booted out of your department and you would be gone. There was a chap in Harvard University called uh, Kilmer McCulley who in the 70s said he was researching a protein called homocysteine, which you may or may not have heard of. Anyway, Children with very high homocysteine levels, a genetic thing, died of heart disease very young. They die of heart disease very early. There's not many of them. So he concluded the homocysteine, and he found out, and he worked out that homocysteine damages endothelium, it damages like galax, it causes nasty things to happen to your blood vessels. So he's working on this hypothesis at Harvard and wrote a couple of papers. And um, essentially, he was hounded out and booted out and not only was he handed out and booted out you can read this it was in the new york times there was an article on him about 20 years ago um when he tried to get another job people from harvard phoned up the universities where, where he was getting interviews and said do not employ this man so it's tricky to go against the ldl hypothesis currently should we say that you will lose your job if you are a researcher. You will lose your income if you, you will lose your department if you're a high ranking person in this area. The reason why I can talk out is A, I'm getting old enough, I don't give a stuff. Uh, and B, I don't do research as a mainstream thing. I write about it. I'm, a, I'm, a, uh, I'm an independent guy who just researches stuff. And, and I speak to people around the world. There are many, many people around the world who do not believe that LDL causes heart disease. Right? I've written papers with them. We've had things published, even in mainstream journals from time to time. But all of us are either not mainstream research people, or we or we do research, or some of them do research in other areas and just have got interested in this area. You know, there's there was a um, a uh, orthopedic surgeon in 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 Australia, and he was talking about the diet part. And he was trying to advise his patients to eat a high-fat diet to lose weight because he said, I'm fed up of having to operate on very obese people and they can never lose weight. And if I do the operation, it's, it's not as successful. So he found that telling people to eat a high-fat diet was very beneficial. It helped them lose weight, blah, 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 blah. Uh, he was attacked by the Australian medical authorities and told, that he must never again write or mention this topic ever again, ever again. Um, and I, I was speaking to a, um, a Marianne, Marianne Demasai, who's an Australian reporter, who used to be with the Australian Broadcasting Corporation and uh, doing programs, um, oh, what was it called? They were sort of investigative programs that you might, you get them in the States, we get them in the UK. And she looked at... Um, uh, catalyst in the form. And she looked at did two programs. One was saying saturated fat doesn't cause 
raise cholesterol and doesn't cause you to deny of heart disease. And the other one saying statins, which are the main cholesterol lowering agents, are have actually got a lot of adverse effects and don't work very well. Uh, and all hell broke loose and she lost her job. They actually went back and tried to accuse her of research fraud so she would have to lose it. She had a PhD. She was a PhD doctor. They tried to get her PhD rescinded so she wouldn't be able to call herself a doctor anymore. Um, you know, I can give you example after example of don't question this hypothesis because if you do, you are gone. You are persona non grata, you know. So um, the hypothesis was nonsense. It never made any sense. But it's become the most profitable area of medicine is lowering cholesterol. I think it, I think diabetes might have got above it, but it, it's right up there. Statins made one trillion dollars in profit during their lifetime. A trillion dollars. So, uh, yeah, the main reason why um, people don't want to look at alternative hypotheses in the mainstream is it, it's a career-ending thing to say, basically. That's it. Or you may or may not know, I'm suing a major newspaper in the UK. It's been going in a case for five years because they claimed that, because I said that statins weren't that effective and that cholesterol didn't cause heart disease, I was causing millions, of, thousands of people to die. So I've taken them to court in a court case that's still going on. Didn't they take your Wikipedia page down too? Oh, it's on my Wikipedia. I didn't actually know I had a Wikipedia page, to tell the truth. Just people phoned me up and said, do you realize you're taking your Wikipedia page down? I went, are they? I've got one. Uh, you know, instead of which I'm now on nothing called Rational Wiki, which is basically, uh, I, don't, I don't know what you call it. Um, it, it, it. They take everything you say and try and just claim you're a, a and it, if you make a joke, and I'm known for writing sort of semi-humorous stuff, they say, and he said this thing, does he really believe this is true? What an idiot he is. Uh, you know, it was a joke. That's what we call it, a joke, right? You know, uh, but anyway, they try and obliterate your reputation. Uh, as I know who these people are. Um, uh, essentially, uh, there's two forces at work here: there's the, the, the pharmaceutical industry, and there is the what they call in America pita and vegans. Uh, and if you try and claim that saturated fat isn't unhealthy, they will try to obliterate you. Right just the case that that happens. They're very strong in their beliefs. That, uh, so, you know, one, not wanting to eat animals is a thing. That's fine. It's not something I agree with. You can hold that view. That's fine. But don't try and claim that it's unhealthy just because you hold a view over here, but that's what they do. They just, and if you try and say that saturated fat consumption isn't bad for you and the fat might be good for you, they just go for you. There were several other people wiped out at the same time by this same group of people, essentially. That's just a thing that happens. I, I, I'm I'm of the, the, I think it was Winston Churchill who said, a man can define himself by his enemies, and I'm, I'm very happy to have these people as my enemies. It means I'm doing something right, can we say that? All right, Malcolm, I'm going to pull you back. You organically got into the thrombogenic hypothesis, which is the alternative one that you're yeah. an advocate for. LPA brought us there when you talked about the fact that this comes in in the beginning when there's damage of the endothelium to patch that yeah. up. Let's go really high level and talk about what the thrombogenic hypothesis is and says, starting with what causes the damage to the endothelium. Right. Well, um, yes, let's say it, the, the hypothesis is to take it to the end point really and work it backwards is is that something, some things, factors, whatever you want to call them, can damage the endothelium. And when the endothelium is damaged, obviously the first thing that happens is is that fires a, a message to the to the body saying we need a blood clot here now. And there are all sorts of things that do that: the clotting system, the clotting cascade, tissue factor, blah blah blah. It's like a big trumpet goes off and says. The endothelium has been damaged in this area and we must get repair, right? But of course, the first thing you have to do is potentially is to stop blood escaping, right? 
So a blood clot forms on that area. Now, it might be very small. It might be so small you couldn't even see it. But if one endothelial cell goes, the blood clot is not going to be a large thing. It's going to be a hundredth of the width of a human hair or something like that. So it's going to be a pretty small blood clot, right? <clears throat> one red blood cell and a bit of fibrin or something. I don't know what the smallest blood clot in the world could be, but it's not going to be very big. Anyway, so you, you, you damage an area of endothelium. A message goes out, blood clot. So LPA arrives, but also what they call platelets, which are small cells that are part of the blood clot. They, they, are, they coordinate the whole process. Um, and you, and you, you get a plug, and then the plug becomes more complicated, and then and red blood cells are brought in, and all things brought in, and the fibrin forms around it. And then at that point, it stops, because obviously if it just kept getting bigger, you'd, you'd die every time there's a blood clot. So at the moment it starts to form, it's also other messages going out saying stop forming. So for every pro-coagulant factor, there's an anti-coagulant factor. The last time I looked, I counted 32 things involved in making blood clots happen and 32 involved in stopping them happening. So there's this constant dynamic process going on. Anyway, so you get a blood clot that forms and it stops forming and then it gets shaved away. And then obviously... the the remnant clot cannot just break off and travel down the artery because otherwise it would cause a damage further down. So unlike on your skin where a blood clot just falls off once it's, the repairs happened underneath it, on your blood vessel wall, the only way you can repair it is to cover it over with a new layer of endothelium because that's the only, that's the only possible way you can repair it. So we have in our bloodstream, we have floating around they're called endothelial progenitor cells, which are sort of young and unformed endothelial cells, they're floating around in your blood. When they see an area of damaged artery and a bit of a clot on top of it, they start sticking to it. And gradually they grow out and, 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 and form a new layer of endothelium. Right? Again, this is not contentious stuff. This is absolutely known and accepted that this is the case. Endothelial progenitor cells are made in your bone marrow and they float about in your bloodstream and they stick to areas of damage and form new endothelium, a new endothelial layer. Clearly, there is some blood clot underneath this endothelial layer, and that effectively is drawn into the artery wall because that's the only place that it can go, at which point the repair systems, well, they're already going, but they, they kick into 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 real action and there are things called macrophages which you may or may not heard of which are the clear up cells in the body so if there's an area of damage and this, the, the macrophages come along and what they actually do is and this is where the oxidation thing also comes back around they fire what they call a superoxide burst at any damaged thing in part in case it was a virus or bacteria so they kill it and then they ingest it within themselves. So they, it's called invagination. So they get full up with debris, if you like. At which point, because they're mobile, these cells are like little amoeba, if you like, that would be it. They then go back into the vas of or, or or they travel up through the lymphatic system to the lymph nodes. You know, lymph nodes are in your neck, in your arm, or whatever. And then they arrive at the lymph nodes. They're then broken down, and then all the stuff just goes into the bloodstream and it gets excreted. So essentially what you get is damage to the artery, new layer of endothelium forms on it, blood clot drawn into the um, artery wall, mostly broken down. I'd imagine in 99.99% of cases, it's completely broken down and you've no, you can't even see it was there. Although the work that Elspeth Smith did was she looked for fibrin in areas of coronary arteries and found it was present all over the place, which led her to say, well, where does fibrin come from? It comes from fibrinogen. Where does fibrinogen, where does this happen? It happens in blood clots. It's the only place you can get it from. The reason we're finding it in apparently healthy arteries is at one time there were blood clots here, but fibrin is very difficult to break down once the plasmin has gone. It's really tough. It's like, you know, like breaking down a wall or something. Anyway, so the hypothesis is that essentially some clots are bigger than others, some clots are smaller than others. But if you've had an area where there's been a bit of damage, 
it is more likely a blood clot will, will happen there again than in other places because you've got a bit of a damaged artery. There's probably a bit of a thickening of the artery wall at that point. Therefore, there are more stresses on that point than there would be elsewhere. Just put it as simply as that. So another blood clot forms on that area, then another one, then another one, then another one, then another one. And gradually, you end up, the repair systems can't sort it out fully. So the plaque starts to grow, and it grows and it grows and it grows, until eventually the plaque itself, what they call ruptures, the, the cap on top of it ruptures, and you get a large blood clot there, fully blocks an artery, and that's a heart attack or that's a stroke. All right? That's the process, if you like. And the evidence, you say, well, yes, why is why doesn't that work as a hypothesis? Now, the main, mainstream accepts that the final event in, in, car, in atherosclerosis or atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease is a blood clot forming on a pre-existing plaque, right? That's accepted, I accept it. That's cert almost certainly what happens. I mean, the blood clot can break off if you've got a plaque in the, in the neck and it's a bit fragile, a bit breaks off and goes into your brain and causes a stroke. Whereas in a heart attack, the clot forms on the area of damage itself, generally, right? Or if it happens elsewhere. So that's accepted, right? It's also known, and you can look at plaques. So people have got angina, which causes narrowing of arteries because of plaque formation in coronary arteries. You can do um, angiograms on these people and look at the plaque. And, and see if it's getting bigger or if it's not getting bigger. In these cases, you use dye, although they diff use different systems nowadays. But they did a study where they looked at plaques in people who'd got angina and they were getting yearly angiograms done. And what they found is plaques either stayed exactly the same size or suddenly they were bigger. All right? They didn't grow. They just didn't grow like that. They didn't. There was called episodic increase in size, all right? In other words, what you're seeing is there was an event there that it grew. Well, what would have made it grow? Well, a, a clot formed on its top of an existing plaque. The endothelium was put on top of it, but actually then that area got thicker. And if you look at a lot of plaques, 40% of them, there was a paper by AHA, which was looking at plaque morphology, which basically means what do plaques look like? It says 40% of plaques show layers like tree rings. So you can see there's been events happening yearly, six monthly, every five years, I don't know. It's like tree rings growing. And they themselves said this is clearly, this is a result of repeated blood clotting on the same point, all right? They've said it. Another, so no one, no one, no one disagrees that plaques kill you because of a clot. No one does the clot, you know, that it's blood clotting that does that. Most People, when you read it, agree that, that you can see plaques growing episodically through what appear to be repeated episodes of blood clotting on the same point. Right? There's not really very much that's contentious about this at all. This is pretty standard for people, the sort of people who research at this level and this level of detail of whom there are not very many. So it's not like people talking about it down the pub. What they will not accept is that it's a blood clot at the, was the first step, right? So there was endothelial damage, blood clot formed, plaque got started, then plaque grows, then finding kills you with the final blood clot. Because LDL causes that. LDL causes this inertial thickening, thickening, right? So LDL causes the original thickening, then everything else is blood clotting. Well, you, you, you can't explain how LDL causes the original thing. I can explain to you I can show you that this happens. I know that this happens. I know that you get endothelial damage on normally healthy arteries because experiments have been done. Um, ironically, one of the most brutal experiments was done in the 1960s on pigs where they anesthetized them. Then they scraped endothelium off the major artery in the, in the, in the abdomen called the... Called the uh, Aorta, sorry, what was talking about? Aorta. And then they stitched them back up and then they waited like a week and killed them and waited two weeks and killed them and waited three weeks and killed another lot. And what they saw was uh, basically atherosclerotic plaque development <laughs> on those areas. 
uh, uh, and they actually saw these pre-endothelial cells, the endothelial progenitor cells, sticking to the plot, to the clot, and they didn't know what they were, right? But they described perfectly what they were. They just didn't know what they were. It was only in the 1990s that people knew these cells existed. Um, slightly ironically, that research was carried out by a tobacco company. Um, but they watched it happening. You know, you could see one week this looked like this, two weeks it looked like this, at three weeks it looked like this, at four weeks it looked like this. What did they do? They went and scraped some of the endothelium off. You don't have to be that drastic. With human beings, they've got healthy volunteers with no known heart disease. And they got them to smoke one cigarette, one cigarette. And they measured, because they couldn't see single endothelial cells dying because it's too small. But when an endothelial cell dies, it releases particles into the bloodstream called microparticles. And if you did a blood test, you could measure that a million or half a million, or I'm not sure how many it was, endothelial cells were killed by cigarette smoke. Cigarette smoke gets into your lungs, by the way, and the particles are so small, they then get into your bloodstream. They then bang up against the endothelium, and they kill cells when they do this. A bit like sepsis kills, but obviously not as drastic. So they could measure the damage being done by one cigarette, and they could tell you that that meant that our number of endothelial cells died at that point. They then also picked up the endothelial progenitor cell production in the bone marrow instantly rose. Right. So the endothelial progenitor cells were kind of trumpet sound went up, we have damage, we need repair. Endothelial cell level went up, they were repaired. Right. So the damage and repair system was was fine. One cigarette's not going to kill you from heart disease. We know that. Twenty cigarettes a day is unlikely to kill you from heart disease, but much more likely than one cigarette at once. A hundred cigarettes a day, you know, really? So it's just the case of if the damage is occurring faster than the repair systems can get to work, then you're going to have repeated problems, and gradually you will end up with these plaques developing throughout your cardiovascular system. But there are many other things that can damage your endothelium as well, of course, and um, high blood sugar levels will do it. You can actually, if you give healthy volunteers an injection bolus of glucose, you can see the glycogenic shrink in front of your very eyes. And then it comes back up again. But if you've got long-term problems with high blood sugar levels, your glycogenic shrinks. Some people say, so how does diabetes? cause heart disease through the thrombogenic hypothesis well we can see it damaging the glycocalyx that's what it does therefore it allows more damage to occur therefore 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 I said I'll explain it to you when I spoke we have spoken before and I looked for the you know you're saying if you're going to have a hypothesis first of all can you find something that contradicts it which is the most important thing to look for can you find anything that definitely causes heart disease rates to be very high that cannot be explained by this hypothesis, in which case it's probably wrong. Right? Single contradictions that, you know, depends how much they are. And the other thing is to say, what other conditions cause heart disease? We're looking at the extremes. I like to look at the extremes because I think that's where the answers lie sometimes. So the condition that causes the greatest rise in the risk of cardiovascular disease that I could find, and I think I've looked harder than most, is sickle cell anemia. Um, and people go, well, how does sickle cell anemia cause cardiovascular disease? Well, the hypothesis, and it wasn't even mine, it was a hypothesis by the people who did this paper. But anyway, they found a, an eight-year-old, I think he was, no, he's an 11-year-old boy with a gangrene in his right leg. And he had gangrene in his right leg because the blood supply in his right leg was so badly compromised. Once your blood supply is that badly compromised, your bits of your body start falling off, really. They get infected and they die. This is what happens to people with diabetes when they get their limbs amputated. At 11 years of age, then they did, they looked at his arteries, and every single artery in his body was impacted with severe calcified, and that's the last stage of atherosclerosis atherosclerotic lesions throughout, right? And you say, well, how? Okay. I mean, it used to be with children had 
severe sickle cell disease were dead by the time they were about four on average. So they weren't dying of heart disease. They were dying of other things, first of all. But once they started managing to treat them with transfusions of normal blood cells and whatever, they started to live longer. But they, they started and, and are still running into problems with premature cardiovascular disease. Right? And so what's the answer to that? Well, the answer is almost so simple. It's like, well, it can't be that simple. A sickle cell disease means your cells are sickle. They look a bit like a scythe or a sickle. They look a bit like the flag for places like Pakistan. They're like crescent shaped with sharp pointy ends. Now, red blood cells are normally nice and round and squidgy. And as they travel through your blood vessels, they bounce off the glycogelix and they whatever. You can imagine it's sharp ended red blood cells hammering through your blood vessels. Well, What's that going to do? That's going to strip off the endothelium. It's going to cause massive blood clots and blood clots to form everywhere, and you're going to develop premature atherosclerotic heart disease. And the authors of that particular paper, looking at this, said that was their explanation. You know, they said the rigid and deformed red blood cells are probably causing blood vessel damage. This would be their explanation. Let's go. Well, take it one step further, guys. Just think the next step. If it's causing heart disease in this condition, then, oh, that's what causes heart disease. Sure, I mean, go just take, but of course, no one will do this next step thing. And the other thing, if you get people with less severe um, sickle cell. One thing that happens in sickle cell is your spleen becomes very big because the spleen is where red blood cells go to die. So there's a very high concentration in there. And if you look at the arteries in the spleen of people who've got sickle cell, they've all got severe atherosclerosis in them. Right? And then you look at other conditions and you say, well, what else causes a high rate of heart disease? Just something that might seem completely different is, is, is cocaine use. right? And in younger males and females who take cocaine, premature cardiovascular disease is the number one risk of death that is happening here, right? You say, oh, okay, so what does cocaine do? Well, you may know that your middle part of your nose, the septum, falls off if you take cocaine, and you end up with a, the gap. Um, why do you end up with a gap? Because cocaine is incredibly uh, strong promoter of vasculitis, which is inflammation and damage to blood vessels. All right. And that's why the blood vessels do it inside of your nose, clog up and get clogged. And that's why you lose the, the center of your nose, the septum falls out. And it's doing the same to your blood vessels all through the rest of the body. It causes endothelial cell damage. It damages the glycocalyx. You're getting blood clots. You get heart disease. And then you die. Blood clotting. Blood clotting, blood clotting, blood clotting, at, or endothelial damage, blood clotting. You repeat this and repeat this, and, and that's that. Or you can look at it the other way around. I was looking at, um, there's a drug called Avastin, which you may or may not have heard of, and it's used in cancer treatment. And uh, interestingly, it's actually uh, 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 a follow-on from, um, from thalidomide. So you may have heard of thalidomide, you probably have. Yeah. It caused children uh, to be born with very short arms and legs and limbs, deformity. You say, why were their limbs so short? The limbs are so short, so it's because thalidomide blocks the creation of new endothelial cells. Right? And it stops blood vessels, therefore, from developing and growing. Right? And because the blood vessels couldn't develop and grow, the arms couldn't grow. So they ended up very short, and their legs ended up very short. Now, that obviously only happened at one stage during the development. If they'd taken it a lot earlier, presumably the fetus wouldn't have grown at all, and that would have been the end of it. But just at that specific point, and that's why they were they were, they were were not damaged enough to kill them, but were damaged enough to have these terrible deformities. Right? So I said, what the hell is thalidomide doing? Well, it actually blocks a thing called vascular endothelial growth factor, VEGF. And VEGF is needed for the creation of new endothelial cells and blood vessels and things like that. And 
So if you give thalidomide, the blood vessels don't grow. If you give Avastin, the blood vessels don't grow. Now, why do they use it in cancer treatment? Because what cancers do is they stimulate, they use VEGF to stimulate new blood vessel cell production to allow the blood supply to them to grow so they can grow. And if you block the blood vessel production, the the tumor can't grow and uh, and and it dies off. And they're quite effective. It's a good drug for that. In fact, they use thalidomide now as a drug for certain cancers, but they don't call it thalidomide because no one would take it. But it is thalidomide. It's called thalid or something. Um, but what they found was, well, you say, well, if you are stopping VEGF causes endothelial cells to grow, and it and it therefore is a good thing for endothelial cell health, right, or production or whatever term you want to use. So if you give VEGFs, you might expect that repair of damaged arteries would be inhibited because you can't grow new endothelial cells. And 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 this is the case. And when they looked at the risk of using Avastin, it was it increased the risk of cardiovascular disease by 400% over a two-year period. It was nearly taken off the market because of this. That's the repair system, if you like. So if you damage the repair system, you also get this problem. And that's why if you give things like steroids, because steroids interfere with the repair processes in the body. So so you can either damage repair, which means that once you've got the blood clot forming, actually the body is hampered in covering it over and creating a new endothelium. And when you look at diabetes, this is another thing. In fact, it, 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 it's what happens in small blood vessels in your eyes is that they, there is inhibition of, of of blood vessel, new blood vessels being formed, and the old ones start to burst and break and break down. So, it, it, in a way, it's a very simple hypothesis. It's that there is a process of endothelial damage, re-endothelialization, if you like, and repair going on. It's happening all the time in your body. Don't look; it might worry you, right? Let's come back to something we talked about earlier with the new physiology knowledge we've gained through our conversation. And that's the fact that this, this new theory, blood clotting, only happens in the arteries. Yeah. Given your example there of sickle cell, the fact that these red blood cells are crescent-shaped and they're damaging the endothelium, let's go back to that and talk about, because obviously those same blood cells are going through the yes. veins and you'd think they'd be damaging the endothelium there. Why are we not having the same thing happening in the veins? Yeah, well, the blood pressure in the veins is zero over six or something. And, and, and the blood flow is much slower and the veins are wider. So there will be some damage being created by sickle cells going through veins. Of course there will, but, but at a much lower level. It's a bit like standing beside a river and it's coming down a mountainside and it's crashing and it's thundering and it's banging and rocks are getting moved and shoved out of the way. Once that same river reaches the plain and turns into a delta, it's kind of sluggish, it's moving slowly. You could sit by it and dip your toe in it and things might, so it's it's just, it's a very simple case that, that yes, when the blood pressure is 140 over 80 and the blood's hammering through at high speed, I mean, coronary arteries themselves, the blood doesn't flow through the arteries when the heart is contracting because the heart contracts so tightly it closes the coronary arteries shut. It's only when the heart relaxes that blood flows through the heart arteries. So you can imagine the stresses and, and pressures that these arteries are under. So compared to veins and even compared to veins and arteries and lungs. If you um, have a condition that creates what they call pulmonary hypertension, in other words, a high blood pressure in your lungs, there's several things that can do this. Then you can get atherosclerotic plaques in your lungs, and you do. Just simply change the blood pressure. So clearly you need at a certain level of blood pressure before there is such a degree of biomechanical stress on the arteries that they are more likely to get damaged. What you tend to find is the plaque development occurs at what they call bifurcations. In other words, like a tree, branches, branches, branches. Obviously those branch points are sharp changes in direction for the blood flow. And at those eddy points, 
that's where you get plaques developing first, right? Because that's where the blood flow is most disrupted. You know, as you say, when a when a when a, a flow of a river hits a rock and it churns and it hammers at that point, well, there's, there's clearly there's a lot more going on there than if it's just going straight down. No matter how fast it would be going straight down. So yes, the answer that it was the the the, uh, the 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 sickle cell analogy is simply that yes, the veins and the bloodstream in the veins is placid enough that the damage is much much less. There's probably damage going on, but at that point the repair is probably keeping up with the damage. So it's relatively straightforward at that point. Right. And I just picked sickle cell. It could be the smoking. It could be the diabetes. Just the fact that, again, coming back now that we understand a little bit more detail, why the veins are generally protected. Well, they are entirely protected, really. Well, you said there is damage, but the mechanisms, it seems, can keep up. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. They're protected from atherosclerotic plaque development. Yeah, you know, you could... I mean, you can do a thing where you do a, for for dialysis, you, you you link a vein and an artery together, and that's where you stick the needle to do the dialysis point. So you have this kind of funny kind of bit, and you'll get plaque development in there in the veins as well, because you're forcing the vein and the artery to come together at that point. So yes, there is surely there is some damage going, and if you smoke a cigarette, there will be some damage going on in the veins as well. There must be because well, it's going into the veins as well. And if it damages endothelial cells and arteries, it will be in veins. But it, it, I sometimes liken it to, it, it, almost like having the safety catch on your on your uh, gun, if you like, that, you know, until you take the safety catch off, it doesn't matter what you do, it ain't going to fire. So that it, in an analogy form, it, the veins have never got the safety catch off, if you like. So you can almost do... You can drop it. You can do anything you like. It ain't. It's not going to go off, right? Until you turn a vein into an artery, and then all hell breaks loose. So it's it. Yeah, I I, I just you read my my book, and I use the analogy of rust on a car. Uh, is that analogy is that unless you scratch the paintwork, all right, and expose the underlying bodywork to the elements, rust will not happen because it's sealed by a protective layer. And then you say, well, what can damage the paintwork of a car? Well, the answer is you could probably sit and think of a thousand things given an hour, couldn't you? You know, a shopping trolley, somebody else's car, a stone, a big hailstone, something being knocked up from the, you know. And so the problem is people have tried to understand heart disease by trying to find a thing that causes it, right? Cholesterol, LDL, whatever rather than saying actually what we have is a process going on here it's, and and what 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 impacts on the process what's actually and many things can so if you're looking at what could scrape the side of your car and cause it to rust it could be a stone and a tin of baked beans that fell out of your shopping bag right and he says well what what connects uh, a stone and a tin of baked beans the answer is nothing really other than what they can do. It's not what they are, it's what they can do. Go back to 1981, there was a paper which looked at all the things that people had discovered, and this is going back 40-something years, that could cause heart, that were associated with increased risk of heart disease. And there were, I think of memory, they'd find 247 things, right? Um, And they couldn't, well, they just, they didn't even bother trying to connect them. They just said, well, these are things like raised copper level, you know, homocysteine, and blood pressure, da 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 you know. And um, could I, could, I never look, I've never looked at the paper in that way before. Maybe I should and just say, right, can I link all of the 247 things they found to the thrombogenic hypothesis? And I'm pretty sure, I mean, that's 1981. By now, there's probably about 10,000. But not one thing will definitely do it. You know, if you have just smoked cigarettes, we know people who smoke cigarettes all their life and they live to 105. You know? um, so you need to smoke cigarettes and have diabetes and have something else, at which point you overwhelm the repair systems and you're off, right? So if you want to prevent heart disease, you've got to sort of not look at it as one thing. You've got to say, Am I doing five things wrong, ten things wrong? 
one thing wrong and then look at that thing and, and try and identify what that is all right well what's happening to me is i'm not you know whatever and that may be different for different people you know so it's why the explanation it's why the 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 cure or the prevention if you like it has to be very individual rather than just look i mean there are certain things none of us should do you shouldn't smoke you know we agree with that you, you shouldn't be under stress because that causes all sorts of problems negative stress you you shouldn't take your bastin but you might have to yeah. you should do various things that can increase you know repair systems or increase the nitric oxide synthesis or all these things that aren't actually protective uh, and and in that way it's much more fascinating but of course it's it's um it's more tricky and especially if the medical profession is just going to focus on you know two things or whatever you know it, it, it drives me around the bend that 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 we're stuck with yeah yeah raised blood pressure can cause cardiovascular disease at a certain point fine lower it raise blood sugar levels so the medical profession the standard medical profession if you like and and the thrombogenic hypothesis actually they're not a million miles apart you know take exercise lose weight don't don't let your blood sugar level get out of control don't smoke take exercise these are all <laughs> positive things but this obsession with the diet and the cholesterol is just is just not right it's it's completely wrong uh, and it needs to be got rid of You've started to touch on this. I want to look at this issue from the other way around to close here. We know things again, like smoking, diabetes, cocaine. We've listed a lot of different things that yeah. can lead to blood clots. What if we look at it the other way around? Things we can do to enhance the endothelium and the glycocalyx, yeah. certain supplements, you touched on exercise. What are some of the things we can do on a positive note, to build that up from the other way. Well, yeah, you can look at certain things that are clear. Um, um, if you're living your life completely perfectly, you don't need to change anything. But I suppose for you, as are. But if, as you get older, the repair systems obviously begin to not work so well. So these things become more likely. So you have to say to yourself, what are the things that I could be doing? That would be most effective on a population level. I mean, forget you know, smoking exercise. That these are done things. Is if you eat a high carbohydrate diet and you've got a lot of sugar kicking around in your system, you need to do something about that. You may not be diagnosed with type two diabetes, but your blood sugar level might be pretty high anyway. So what I would say to people is either do intermittent fasting just to. Make sure your body uses up the sugar levels, if you like, and therefore your body can deal with carbohydrates better or reduce the carbohydrate consumption. That's good. Another thing that is really good is sunshine. This is where uh, the medical profession and I part ways again. Sunshine uh, stimulates, it lowers your blood pressure. It stimulates the release of nitric oxide in your blood vessels and actually you synthesize nitric oxide in your skin and it's stored for a certain amount of time somehow or other i'm not sure how and it and it that helps to protect because when i was talking about vegf nitric oxide is actually sort of vegf in another form it protects your blood vessels it allows you to stimulate more um, um endothelial progenitor cells it stops blood clotting it's really really good you know for those who have, say, a high LPA level, all right, then you you have to almost double these issue things that will prevent things from clotting. How do you protect the glycocalyx? Well, actually, there's certain proteins that you can eat and uh, eat. Yeah. Uh, chondroitin sulfate, which you may have heard of, that people use for the cartilages. Actually, if you give people chondroitin sulfate, it increases the the, the glycocalyx strength and makes it more. Uh, effective at pr being protective, for example. So you need to be doing. I don't, you know, the problem I have with a lot of things is, is people just give too many bloody things. You know, here's here's 96 things you can do to prevent heart disease. Like, well, you're just not going to do it, are you? Because frankly, it's too much of a bloody hassle. I mean, there are those amongst us who've got that mentality. I don't, all right. 
Uh, the other key thing that, go, that is associated with a big high risk is, is what I call negative or chronic negative strain or stress. This triggers just so many damaging things that end up having a battle in your endothelium and blood clotting and everything like that. And so looking at your social interactions, how you get on with people, making sure you have positive relationships. If you're being bullied at work, this is terrible and disastrous for you. Um, they looked at certain countries. I'll give you an example is that in, in Russia, following the collapse of the Soviet Union, the financial and other strain in society was, was enormous. And actually, the life expectancy in, um, in Russia fell seven years over a four-year period. Seven years. There's a study in South Africa that showed that men who had, it's more men than women, men are worse affected by strain than women. Um, maybe it's because we don't have anybody to speak to, so our stress never gets released. So we, we talk about football rather than uh, you know, seeing how we feel. Uh, but men who had financial issues and pressures in this study were 18 times more likely to die of a heart attack in the next five years. All right. So having chronic financial worries, having poor interactions and social interactions it is right up there in my world at being very near the top of things you need to address. Because they looked at uh, Sweden and Lithuania at one point, called the Liv Cordia study, where they looked at why were Lithuanian men having six times the rate of heart disease of Swedish men. And these populations at one time were genetically the same because Lithuanian, Swedish Lithuanian empire was one big thing so these are genetically and in all other ways the same and the the, the risk factor they found the greatest were social and psychological risk factors the sense of being under strain the sense of having no purpose the strength of did i did die and their heart disease rate was way up here in comparison other risk factors you know blood pressure blah 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 were not that different this was key so i would always say to people this is this is my number one, personally, right? outside of the obvious other things that we've discussed. And there, there are supplements and things. How gigantically effective they are, I'm not sure. And obviously, if you don't have a deficiency in vitamin D, or you don't have a deficiency in vitamin K2, or you don't have a deficiency in these things, you don't need to take it. All right? And um, so the, these are quite individual things, and I wouldn't suggest everyone takes 53 different supplements without first checking whether they need to take the bloody things or not. Yeah. All right, Malcolm, we'll end it there. And you touched on the fact we've connected before and we actually had done this conversation previously and had a tech issue. So thank you for coming on and doing this two times. And <laughs> I really enjoyed preparing for this interview, learned a lot and uh, enjoyed the conversation. So thank you. We're going to link you up your book, your website, everything in the show notes, your social media. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Cheers. Now that you're done with Malcolm, you're going to want to stick around here and catch my chat with Dr. Ovedia. He's a heart surgeon who shares his perspective on heart disease as well. I'll see you over there. The first uh, 10 plus years as a heart surgeon, I was increasingly unhealthy. I was morbidly obese. I was pre